Donald George Bradley, born 1908, son of a carpenter from Bowral in New South Wales. Son of a carpenter? It's worth a thought. An exceptional athlete, excelling in uh, tennis, golf, running, shooting, ping pong, marbles, and of course, cricket. His average score in his first season was 101. He holds the record for the highest score in first class cricket, 452 not out. The highest score in test cricket, 334. The most number of runs in a day, 309. The most number of runs in a series, 975. And this on foreign soil. The cold and the damp of England can't phase him. And in Australia, when it's 100 in the shade, he can score 300 in the sun. The man is a veritable batting machine, and still only 23. If he continues in this fashion, he will become the most phenomenal batsman of all time. Imagine what history will say about the man who was able to defeat him. Yes, please. What else do you have? I need all the information I can get. His batting averages on every type of wicket. I need to look at every time he's failed, see if there's a common element. We must find his weakness. Well, assuming he has one. What we must do first is talk to some bowlers. Fast bowlers. Was there no time you had him worried? No, Mr. Jardine. I bowled fastest and hardest I could at him, but he always had my measure. Well, a couple of our chaps did try bowling around the wicket, and his leg stump. Well, that kept down his runs. <laughs> Bradman wouldn't have liked that? No, no, he didn't. Yes, he likes to make runs, doesn't he? Thank you, George. Well, apart from that, there was no other time we had him in the slightest amount of difficulty at all. Thank you, George. Perhaps if you spoke with someone who bowled at him more often. Lowood, for instance. Uh, Harold, you've bowled a lot of balls to Bradman. Aye. He hit most of them, too. You know, he scored more runs off me than anyone in the 1930 series. He's a fair hand with the bat, all right. What about the Oval, the last test? Oh, I'd rather forget that. He scored 232. After Rain had stopped play, you were brought back on. I got a bit of lift and thought for a moment I might have him. Yes, he went through for a suicide run to get off strike, do you remember? Oh, with the end of a long day, we'd all had enough. His concentration had gone. Well, I thought that he was nervous. Well, I am fast, Mr. Jardine. Yes, I know, Harold. Could you just think, try to remember each ball? Well, there was one thing, though I didn't pay it much mind at the time. When you come into ball, Bradman, there's one thing you always notice. Sets him apart from other batsmen. He don't move. He stands perfectly still. Well, the fourth or fifth ball, our last over, as I came in to deliver, I, I noticed him sort of uh, moving, sort of edging away. Nah, I don't know. I thought I saw his feet move, but no one else noticed it. Did he do it again? No, after that, he went straight through for the run. Sorry, Mr. Jardine, it's not much, but it's the only time I sensed I had him in trouble. Thank you, Harold. That's it. Did you see it? What? Play it again. Now, watch his foot. All right, so he moved his foot. Douglas, you're making too much of this. No, Percy, I'm not. Larwood also sensed something. He said it was the only time that he detected any movement from Bradman before the delivery. Oh, come, come. All batsmen move their feet. I myself have not the habit Redman. of... All right, so he moved his foot. Now, where does that get you? Come over here. Oh, just a minute. Ready? Now, <clears throat> the ball pitches short. Uh -huh. 
and comes at you head high. How would you play it? Oh, surely it's obvious. Show me. Onto the back foot, play it defensively, or step inside the line and dispatch it for four. A preferably six. Fine. Now, watch this. Now watch his back foot. See? Now, you do the same thing. Well, mm. here comes the short-pitched ball. What stroke are you playing? A oh, bloody awful one. How would you feel if you played a stroke like that to a head-high ball? Nervous. Precisely. It could be the ball to which Bradman doesn't have an answer. What I need are men who can bowl short, fast, and accurately. Ball after ball, hour after hour. Yes, fast bowlers. As many as I can get. Well, it may be what you'd like. It's not what the selectors are going to give you. We'll worry about the selectors later. Let's see the bowlers first. In Australia, the weather's hot, the grounds are hard, the ball loses its shine early and won't do what you want it to. If you want to be in my team, you will all have to be fitter than you've ever been. Swifter than arrow from Tartar's bow. And twice as accurate. Bose, what do you think about that? All right, it's fine by me. I'm soon to be married. I could use the extra money. Bose? Aye. Uh, I just like Craig and Bradman. Harold? <laughs> A bit short, aren't they? No, oh, just an experiment. Rather dangerous experiment, if you ask me. Someone might get hurt. <coughs> I say. Well bowled, Harold. He's the fastest bowler on the face of the earth. Yes, but is he fast enough for Bradman? It is spin bowling which will beat Bradman, if anything will, especially on Australian wickets. Nobody has used pace properly. Well, it's good that you're thinking broadly, old chap, but I think you're barking up the wrong tree. If I were you, I'd stick to my spin attack. So you believe that pace bowling is the solution to our Bradman problem? 
Yes, sir, I do. Mm. What does Plum think of your intentions? Uh, well, he thinks I'm wrong. Yes, well, of course, he has been considering the evidence. Bradman has been dismissed more often by spin than by pace. It's an aberration. Pace has never been used consistently as part of an overall strategy. Oh. Well, tell me all about your strategy. That would be premature, but I do have particular requirements. Bradman is an unorthodox batsman. We must employ unorthodox tactics. Do you want me to talk to the selectors? Well, only should it become necessary. I merely wanted to inform you of the state of play. You learn quickly, Douglas. There are more games won off the field than on it. So Douglas became obsessed with Bradman, while 12,000 miles away in Australia, the boy wonder had become more than a cricketing phenomenon. He was now a national celebrity, the first of a new breed of sporting heroes, his publicity value paying huge dividends for the hero of a nation. For Bradman, the price of fame was to be a clash with bureaucracy, which almost resulted in his giving up cricket and Douglas Jardine losing the target of all his battle plans. The board will see you now, Mr. Bradman. Good morning, darling. Dr. Robertson, do sit down. Uh, you know Mr. Jeans? Good morning, Don. And Mr. Oxlade? Well, thank you for coming in, Don. The reason we've asked you along today is that uh, we have a problem. This three-way contract you've signed, uh, it includes writing for the newspaper. Yes. Uh, yes, yes. Well, I'm afraid that is in direct contravention of control board regulations. You, you see, Don, this uh, clause that Dr. Robertson is referring to specifically states... The that gist of it is that no player is allowed to write for a paper if he's also playing in the test matches. Is it all right for me to do the sporting promotions? Oh, certainly. Oh, certainly. And to continue my radio broadcasts? There's nothing in the regulations about broadcasting. Even though I'll be commenting on the cricket. This regulation predates the introduction of the uh, wireless. Now, let me get this straight. You're saying that I can promote sports goods and broadcast cricket comments on the wireless, but I can't write about it in the newspaper. That's correct, Don. Well, that is ludicrous. You must appreciate that we, as the watchdogs of Australian cricket, must ensure some order is maintained. Only players whose sole occupation is journalism are exempt from the ruling. And you must appreciate that I am not qualified for anything else. And I can't earn a living from playing cricket in Australia. My only alternative would be to take up the offer to play as a professional in England. Well, we, we wouldn't want that, Doc. What other choice do I have? I will not renege on my contract. Jess? Mum? Jessie? <laughs> Jessie's trying on a wedding dress. Jess, I need a letter typed. Those galahs at the cricket board are making me jump through hoops. Well, he can't see me in my wedding dress. It's bad luck. We won't be long. Well, I, I'd, I'd like it now. I want to catch the afternoon mail. The mail, sir. Oh, thank you, Maud. From Barrel. Milk. Or lemon? Uh, milk. No, no, uh, lemon. Bradman's request for permission to write. We can't allow any player to dictate terms. Cricket is a game for 11 a side, not a parade of film stars. This public idolatry of Bradman threatens the very future of cricket. Oh, you're right, Alan. Nevertheless, we couldn't afford to lose him. 
Does he make any mention of the England offer? Cricket without Bradman would be like Hamlet without the Dane. That's a little extreme, surely. Besides, I don't think Bradman would be prepared to abandon cricket or move to England. Anyway, there's no urgency. The test series is months away. I think we can afford to let him uh, sweat on it for a while. Well, I think we have it now. Listen to this. Alan Bowes Vos Larwood Tate. The most formidable array of fast bowlers ever assembled. And the batsman? Uh, Sutcliffe, Bob Wyatt, Hammond, Duleep, Leyland, Robbins. I've been thinking of the Nawab of Pittordi. Hmm? He's just come down from Oxford. Well, he's gone home to India. Yes, but I'm sure he'd love to come along with us on the tour, play the Black Prince in the Antipodes. And you, Doug the Joiner, shall play the Lawrence part. I hope here is a play fitted. Finalise the team. It's time mm -hmm. to celebrate. Oh, I knew it was time for something. I have just the thing. What on earth are you doing? Attracting your attention. Although perhaps I should be wearing a cricket pad. Ah, I notice that there's a blank space on your dance card, Miss. There's a blank space in my life. Please? Yes, yes, I'll tell him. Goodbye. Well, it's Lord Harris's butler. Been hunting you all over town. Wants to see you immediately. No, well, can't it wait till the morning? Ah, but the thing is, he may not be around in the morning. That's from our very first test in India. Do you remember India, Douglas? Indeed I do, my lord. Remember your first cricket bat? Very well. And who gave it to me? <laughs> and I remember a small boy in Bombay who told me his greatest ambition was to wear the harlequin cap. I watched him grow. I watched him learn the game of empire. I noted with pride his captaincy of Winchester. And when he was chosen to play for his country, no one was happier for you than I. Then, when you were ready, I saw to it that you became captain of England. I recognized in you something that nobody else could see. I saw a man imbued with the courage of his convictions. A man who used justice when possible. Severity. <laughs> Severity when necessary. <coughs> Douglas. You know and I know that the time for severity is now. It'll bring England back to her rightful place of supremacy and the ashes back where they belong. Now, you can do it. You are a man of vision. 
God knows there are too few of us left, but Douglas, don't falter. Don't let the selectors or the lords or anyone else obscure that vision. There are men who will oppose you, but they are weak men, mean men. They are frightened of your power. Now, be hard, be audacious. Toujours audace. <laughs> get out, get out. <coughs> Shall I call the doctor? Ah. <laughs> that old leech keeper waiting for me to die, but I won't give him the satisfaction. Not until you brought me back the act. The night Lord Harris lost his struggle for life, I lost Douglas. Before he entered that room, he was a man with a vision. When he came out, he was imbued with a sense of destiny. There was no stopping him. I'm sorry, but this is impossible. It leaves no room for my pace attack. But these are the recommendations of your selection committee. Yes, sir, but it is I who must lead the team and determine its strategies. Yes, but, sir, uh, we know nothing of these strategies. As one who's been in my present position, Plum, you'll appreciate, I'm sure, that that is the captain's prerogative. Yes, yes, but as captain, I always listen to my selection committee. Are you saying you know better than Plum, than all of us? In this matter, sir, yes, I am. Well, I could never agree to this team of yours. I must support Plum. Either I lead my team or I lead no team at all. You cannot dictate terms to the MCC. Well, in that case, my formal resignation will be in your hands tomorrow. Good morning, gentlemen. The Lords were caught on the horns of a dilemma. Perhaps Douglas could retrieve the ashes for them, but at what cost? So it was that Plum Warner found himself summoned by Lord Hawke to a meeting with the secretary to the king, Sir Clive Wigram. His majesty is quite fond of young Bradman. Of course, he would like to see the ashes back in England. It seems Jardine may be able to accomplish that. I can't help feeling... Well, with Jardine as captain, we may win the ashes, but we may also lose a dominion. Uh, we believe we have a remedy for that. If we send along a strong team manager... A man experienced in the rigours of touring cricket. And a man loved by the Australians. So Plum Warner became watchdog for the tour, and Douglas got his team. Glad you didn't take up that England offer, comrade. Spare word? And if you can keep up, Chuck. Jardine's team? I've got Jardine's team. Back page. Marwood, Vos, Vos, Alan Tate. Five fast bowlers. What's he got in mind? This is the Gaumont British News, presenting the homeland to the Dominion. The MCC team leaves England. 
Vice Captain Bob Wyatt and Middlesex fast bowler Gubby Allen arrive at Southampton Docks to be met by skipper Douglas Jardine and team manager Plum Warner. The MCC team is departing for Australia in an attempt to regain the ashes lost in 1930. Will they prevail against the heat and the dust and the flies, and above all, against the Australian batting phenomenon Don Bradman? Allen will form part of a formidable array of fast bowlers, men like left-hander Bill Bowes and pride of Nottingham Harold Lowood, chatting with Yorkshireman Bill Bowes, a late addition to the team. Little Lancastrian Eddie Painter demonstrates his form with the bat. Wicketkeeper Leslie Ames seems to be offering valuable hints to Painter, who's representing England abroad for the first time. In the midst of economic turmoil, the bonds of empire are stronger than ever. Bound for Australia on HMS Arontes is British government representative, Mr. Ernest Crutchley. To all our far-flung people, I say, let us get together and keep together and never drift apart. We are of one stock. We share the same ideal. Let us go forward, side by side, helping each other over the rough patches and sharing the good things when they come. A commonwealth of nations with a commonwealth of interests and affections. Oh, so Come on, lads. Time for a run. Time for a run. Where's the bloody fire? Excuse me, ladies. I hate to but Mr. Allen and Mr. Wyatt have a prior engagement. What an adventure we have before us. We have a real battle ahead of us, Patty. I promise you at least one century. Excellent. I need all I can get. Ah, Douglas. Pardon us for interrupting you, but uh, I thought we should have a little talk. <laughs> yes, certainly. About what? A strategy? Not yet. Uh, Douglas, I'm one of five fast bowlers. I wonder what part you see me playing. I'd like you to take as many wickets as you can. <laughs> <laughs> Good heavens, man. Gubby is one of your fast bowlers. Bob is your vice captain, and I'm your team manager. Surely we have a right to know. Well, of course you have. But at the right time. I should have thought the right time is now. Plum, I am sorry. You simply must trust me. Well, it's time for the four o'clock run. Mm. See you later. Well, how goes it, boys? Well, Fine, Mr. Skipper. Jardine. You feeling fit, Bose? Aye, sir, like a racehorse before the derby. You know what they're saying about us, boys? They say Bradman's got us licked. Ah, well, <laughs> we'll see about that. They say if we can't beat them on the English pitches, what chance do we have on theirs? Ball faster, sir. Do you know what it's like in the Australian summer, bows? The ground is hard, the pitch is slow, and kind to batsmen. And the Australian sun, well, Harold will tell you, you'll lift to curse it. What is it you want of us, Skipper? I want you to bowl faster than you've ever done before, and more accurately. I will call upon you to do it hour after hour, day after day. 
and to do curse not only the sun, but the name Jardim. Our reward will be the ashes. Goodbye again. Goodbye. Well, Plum, are we all ready? I think so. Local character, Ernest Jones. He used to be a fast bowler. I saw him break a batsman's ribs once. Uh, now he just follows the Australian team around. He's harmless now. Australia has been sent for the Ashes. England, go home! Hey, what can you expect from Australia? We are entering the land of the barbarians. <laughs> Joking aside, we of the Australian Cricket Board are proud to make the first gesture of welcome to the English team. I would now like to call upon a great man of cricket and a great man of empire, the MCC manager, Mr. Pelham Warner. Thank you, Dr. Robertson and members of the Australian Cricket Board for those kind words of welcome. There are no better hosts nor no truer friends than Australians. I admire your sterling character and have developed a healthy respect for your cricketers. You know, the very word cricket has become a synonym for all that is true and honest. To say that is not cricket implies something underhand, something not quite in keeping with the best ideals. And this is the aim of the Maribyrn Cricket Club, of which I am a humble, if devoted member, to preach the gospel of British fair play as developed in its national sport. Bob White, Bob? Damon oh, yeah. Batsman. <laughs> Thank you very much, Victor. Which the clue to the five fast bowlers in it? That's Jerry. Ah, ah yes. <laughs> well, a bit of cricket as well, of course. In spare time. <laughs> and drinking them. Mm. Yes. Your first test against the MCC. That's not a big deal. Let's hope we'll be. If you'll excuse me. What does that badge mean? It's our cricket board, sir. They won't let Mr. Bradman play in the test. I'm sorry? Mr. Bradman, sir. They won't let him play. Something wrong? It appears Mr. Bradman will not be playing in the series. Why on earth not? Well, the Australian cricket board. The bureaucrats have struck again with the full force of their mediocrity. I beg your pardon? Clive Cooper, Associated Press. Bradman's writing for a newspaper. The board doesn't think it's cricket. And what's he doing here? Ah, the board, in its wisdom, will permit him to play in all the preliminary matches, but not the test matches. Dr. Robertson, this is true. Yes, I'm afraid so. Oh, this is totally bizarre. I've travelled 12,000 miles to play against him. Surely you're here to play against an Australian eleven, not just an individual. Yes, well, of course. You see, the board does have a very 
strict policy in this matter. We did not approve the selection of any player for any test side who was also writing on that particular test series. Is this decision irrevocable? Certainly not. It's entirely in Mr. Bradman's hands whether he plays or not. Well, what does he have to do? I'll simply promise not to write while he's playing in a test series. And have you discussed the matter with him? The board is shortly meeting with Mr. Bradman in Sydney. I trust we shall resolve the matter then. And surely I don't have to remind you we're in the middle of a severe economic depression. People are reluctant to part with their money. And they certainly won't do so if they can't watch Bradman. The game is more important than the individual. If we allow ourselves to be dictated to by players, who knows where it will end. One day matches for the convenience of the press. Later starting times to suit the radio stations. Giving it to Bradman could set an unhealthy precedent. Well, it'll be unhealthy if we lose money on this tour. And we will lose money if Bradman doesn't play. More to the point, we'll lose the test series if Bradman doesn't play. It isn't whether we win or lose. Of course it's whether we win or lose. The Australian public doesn't want to see the English going home with the ashes. Mr. Bradman is here. Oh, uh, send him in. Uh, just give us a minute, though. Well, then we're agreed. We can't back down. Alan, before you... Aubrey, leave it to me. I know that when it comes to the crunch, you'll want to play in the tests. Morning, Don. Dr. Roberts. Come in, come in. Uh, take a seat. Thank you. A cup of tea? No, thanks. Uh, now, Don, um, as, we, as we explained to you at our last meeting, <clears throat> the situation with your present contract is uh, a very delicate one. But, Dr. Robertson, I wrote to you about that months ago, as you requested. What more can I do? <laughs> well, you see, um, uh, our problem is, Don, that we can't approve the selection in a test of any player who is writing about that series. I'm sure you will appreciate, Don, that it could be most well, disruptive to have one member of the team commenting on the selection or performance of any other member of the team. The problem is that only players whose sole occupation is journalism are exempt from the ruling. Yes, and, and in your case, you're also promoting sporting goods and uh, broadcasting on the wireless. Well, that makes three occupations. I have a three-way contract, part of which involves writing for the newspaper. It is a contract which I must honour. If that means giving up cricket, then I will give up cricket. No, oh, Don. Surely you can reconsider. No, I came here today to ask the board to reconsider. It seems that I have failed. We can't have him dictating to this board. But if we stand fast, I know he'll back down. Don't let those fools on the control board get to you. They're just petty bureaucrats, full of their own importance. And I can't expect you to give up that newspaper contract to earn half that money playing cricket. If they don't allow you to play because of some silly little rule, then millions of Australians will come down and drag them out of their offices and throw them off the Sydney Harbour Bridge. <laughs> it's not just them. You know, they all reckon he's mad bringing five fast bowlers out here because our wickets are slow. But he's up to something and I don't know what it is. Wondering if we could have a chat with you, Skipper. Well, it's about tactics for the tests. 
Yes. Well, well, it, it, it's just that um, all this training on ship and uh, the occasional remarks you've made to some of us. Well, we, we don't know how it is we're supposed to play. Well, you're supposed to play the way you're told to. That's what I brought you here for. I told you. Aye, well, that's what we want to do, Skipper, but we'd like to know how and why. Why? Because I bloody well say so, that's why. If you don't like it, you can take the next boat back to England. I told you to say that. Well, I, I hardly think that can be right, Skipper. I mean, a man deserves to know what's expected of him, else how can he do his best as a bowler? Is that the way you feel as well, Bose? Aye, I'm with the lights. And you, Harold? Mr. Jardine, I know you stuck up for me when others were against me. And I'm grateful to you for that. You know, I'd do anything you asked me to do on a cricket field. But I do believe I'd do a lot better if I knew what you're after. Very well, sit down, all of you. Come along. Take that. Thank you. Thank you. Now, thus far, I've impressed upon you all the importance of accuracy. We must be systematic. We must concentrate our attack on one side of the wheel. Now look here. Here's the wheel. I believe we should attack the lakeside. I shall back you up by placing a field something like this. We can keep it. I should place one or perhaps two men on the offside. Here and here. Then a couple in the deep. Here and here. And the majority close in on the lake side. Two leg slips. Backward square leg. Short forward square leg. And a very silly middle. Well, that's old fashioned leg theory. I will always keep the runs down. I don't just want to stop them scoring. I want to get them out. That's why you must be accurate. I want to bowl short and to make the ball rise up at the batsman. If he hooks, he risks being caught in the deep. If he defends, he risks popping a catch up to the leg train. And if he doesn't defend, ah, he risks getting hit. Precisely. And no batsman likes being hit, especially Brad. Harold, you remember the Oval in 1930? Aye, well, we scored 232. Ah, but you unsettled. Now we must pull out all the stops. I want you to all bowl this form of leg theory at the trial match in Melbourne. Good. Right. Sounds good to me. Short and fast and accurate. Let's keep this to ourselves. Uh, Mr. Allen, I'll talk to Gabby. I don't want you discussing this with anyone. I want this to come as a surprise to Mr. Brandon. 